Good afternoon and welcome to Teaching Artist Tuesdays. Another great session with some very special panelists today. And our topic is going to be digital integration for virtual experiences, which I know all of you have been wrestling with for the past few months. Um, today, our logistics are going to be similar to previous sessions if you've been with us. If you have comments or questions, please drop them in the chat box. If you're on Facebook, we will have someone watching those boxes and pulling in the questions for our panelists later on in the discussion. Um, also, be sure to check in the chat box. Um, Lenora has placed the link for the Teaching Artist Certificate Program and also the link for the um, program today. You can also find recordings of today's discussion on the North Carolina Arts Council website and on our Facebook page, as well as the Teaching Artist Certificate Program Facebook page. So if you miss any of it or you have friends that want to catch it, please refer them to those sites. We have some very special panelists today, and during this session, they will be discussing various ways that artists and teaching artists have had to adapt to this virtual world that we're currently existing in. They will help us explore ways that they have experienced digital platforms and virtual work, and they will also help us um, to see how your work might fit into today's digital climate. We have a wonderful moderator and contributor today, and that is Scotty Henley. I'm making it blush, uh, director of the Clayton Arts Center. Uh, Scotty has been working with North Carolina Arts Council uh, the last few months, and we really appreciate that on helping us to uh, disseminate uh, live stream programming across the state. He works, he's the executive director for the Clayton Center in Clayton, North Carolina, which houses a 600 seat theater as well as a 12,000 square foot meeting space. They put on a series of live performances and during the onset of COVID-19 um, have been streaming a variety of performances on Wednesday nights. So over a half year of Wednesdays now, the live streams continue with additional supporting streams provided for neighboring venues and for communities as far away as Asheville. And Scotty, we so appreciate the work you've been doing at the Clayton Center. And I'm going to allow you to introduce our special panelists today. Well, thank you very much, Sharon, and thanks for that uh, nice introduction. And, and it has been a long time of streams. And I, I would like to say, first, the, the the challenge for artists has been that they perform our stage, and there's nobody in front of it, um, in front of them, and us. And uh, we applaud as loud as we can, but uh, sometimes that's not enough. Um, it's exciting to, to share the panelists that have uh, invested and have diversified approaches uh, as it relates to this digital content that our uh, pandemic bubble we currently live in. So in no particular order, at least from my screen, um, our first panelist is an educator for, uh, at uh, North Carolina Central University. Uh, he teaches mass, mass communications. He created a performing platform called Brett's Open Mic, uh, where local and national performers have shared their craft and which recently celebrated its 24th anniversary. Fantastic, great for you. So folks, please welcome Brett Eric Chambers. We're gonna stay in the, uh, the educator realm. Uh, this fascinating lady has made her mark as director of education of the National Museum of Art at Duke University. And of the many areas that she has her fingertips on, one is entitled Reflections uh, Alzheimer's programs, which uh, hopefully she can expand a little bit on that. It's, it seems very challenging, but very uh, uh, worthy effort. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Ms. Jessica R K. Rule. Thanks for being with us, Jessica. Our next panelist uh, recently graduated from North Carolina Central University with a degree in vocal performance. Uh, and she's already shared the stage with Branford Marsalis, Take Six, and Nina Freelon. She is a native of Durham and is a lead cast member for the wildly acclaimed STEM, the musical. You guessed it, it's Miss Tyra Scott. Hi, Tyra. And in my opinion, uh, and you'll probably get this from the appropriately use of the word foundation after I say this, having served nine years in the Air Force and Air Force Reserves as for herself and 17 years as an Army spouse, 
She has been the program operations manager since 2019, specializing in developing a resilience programming to meet the ever-changing needs of military families and service members. Uh, please welcome Heather Rossi. Hi, Heather. So uh, I take it that we want to jump right into the, the question, the first question that we have here, which is going to be, I think, what everybody would like to know what we have been doing. So the question starts off like this. We are squarely focused uh, since the onset of the pandemic on how we continue to function as artists and supporters of artists through a digital lens and on digital platforms. What has been your go to digital platform? Um, let me start with Brett. Let's hear what you have been up to and what you've been using and what your platform of choice has been at this time. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is pretty cool. Um, and I think we're all kind of used to looking at these tiles now. Uh, one of the things, uh -huh. about, yeah, well, yeah and, and it's good to see all of you, uh, especially Tyra, uh, because of her performance schedule and the STEM piece and and my my buddy Branford. So, uh, uh, to get to the point, um, there's so many different tools in the toolbox these days. So for me, it's a I don't have like a go to. Mine is what am I doing? Um, because the go to tool I use the most is that high tech thing between my ears called my brain. Um, that's my favorite technology because it decides all the other different technologies until the AI takes over. And I've, and I've seen the AI, it is scary. <laughs> don't, get, don't get me wrong. So to answer your question, for the open mic, the, my, the main technology that I use for that is a old Pixel 2 that, that, that streams, <laughs> streams our open mic um, on, a, on, a, on one of these. I, I put the phone on here, you know, Little, little little monopod tripod, um, and I use um, Facebook Live, and then I use Lightroom from the Adobe Suite to edit my pictures, and I put that up. In class, I use Zoom, and as a matter of fact, we use Zoom for a while to do a, what we call a family meeting every Wednesday night uh, until we went back face to face. So we're back face to face now, but those are my main ones. But I've I've I teach, so I use a lot of different technologies. So I'll, I'll leave it there and we can come back to it. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I offer uh, each one of you the opportunity to just go ahead and chime in when, you, when you'd like to. And when you hear something that may either complement or help um, correct something that maybe we're having a problem with. So at any time, feel free to, to jump in. Tyra, do you, do you have something that you would like to share with us in regards to the platform you chose it and, and what's been working for you and what your challenges might be? So for me personally, um, I know uh, I just, first of all, I just moved to Charlotte a couple months ago, but um, before I moved, what I was doing was giving lessons, giving music lessons uh, via Skype, via FaceTime. So those are the two that have really, uh, that I've been going to the most, that I've been relying on the most. Um, I've been helping a few of my friends with their um, concerts online because that's a whole thing now just because, you know, the, because of the pandemic, there's nowhere to go. And, you know, people still need to uh, find ways to make money. And so with all the concerts being canceled in person, almost everyone I know has now moved over to um having those concerts online and selling admission for it and things like that. And so uh, I guess YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Skype, FaceTime will be my go-to platforms for, especially for what I have to do and what needs to be done in terms of what thing, people come to me for. And are you finding that your your students or the challenges that they're having, are they able to overcome those challenges and, and be able to find themselves on the platform that works for them? Or are they coming back to you and saying, I, I need some more help or assistance in that line? It's been it's been going pretty well. Um, uh, on one side for my lessons, of course, we have to sometimes deal with the lag if they're not in a 
good space and things like that. But with the concerts and things, other than the technology and things that could go wrong with it behind the scenes in terms of streaming and uh, quality audio and video, um, I think that um, I know YouTube specifically, you can have only maybe like up to 50 participants at a time. Uh, and if somebody logs in, if a 51st person comes in, like somebody gets kicked out and, you know, if they pay admission, that's a really big problem. So I feel like there aren't many platforms that um, remedy that yet. I think that would be the only problem. Is that a YouTube or is that a Zoom format that does that? YouTube. YouTube? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good work. And Jessica, with the museum, you obviously have some other uh, challenges than, say, the person who's the, the musical interest who's trying to, to sing into in front of a camera. Um, and how you're getting through this pandemic era with your platform. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Scotty. Like others, it's hard for me to name a single platform that we're using exclusively with teaching artists. We're really finding that Zoom and Instagram are our two go-tos when we're doing um, active teaching artists experiences where we're hoping for visitors to really participate and engage with the artist. Um, the, the way we're deciding between either Zoom or Instagram is really off of the viewer experience and what we're hoping they'll get out of it for the sessions where we'd like it to be a smaller audience and more verbal engagement with the teaching artist. It's gonna make a lot more sense for us to host it on Zoom. Um, and then for opportunities where we're looking for a broader audience and not necessarily needing everybody to be together simultaneously, in Instagram becomes our go-to platform. So one of the things we find with Instagram is that we'll oftentimes have participants from six, seven, eight folks all the way on up to a hundred people at a given time but even the sessions that only have a handful of people, we're seeing hundreds of folks who watch the video after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, so for something that's on Instagram, it's gonna have a much broader reach even beyond the date and time when it's live. Um, and so, so that's gonna be a really different experience than what we're doing on Zoom. And I'm curious, since you're utilizing Instagram and that's a Facebook product, do they do they integrate in any way? I mean, can you work on both platforms so that you have Instagram and Facebook going simultaneously in any ways? So we've been keeping ours just on Instagram at this point. We've used Facebook for some of the promotion and advertising of the events, but we've had the event itself live exclusively on Instagram both for the live portion and the recorded video after the fact. And then with the Zoom portion, and I'm, I'm going to go back to what Tyra was talking about in regards to YouTube. And I didn't know that uh, with YouTube, if you had 50 um, participants or go over the 50 mark, that it would kick people out. And I know with Zoom, there's certain levels you can pay for. Uh, so that you integrate yourself up from like 49, 49, 49, I think is the deal. Are you, are you purchasing a, a larger a footprint to have? Or are you sticking with a, a standard, the, the standard 49 or 100 that you can get into? And how are you working with that? Yeah, so we aren't, it is, you're absolutely right. It is an option to expand your audience size in Zoom. Um, we're opting not to. We're deliberately keeping Zoom for groups that would be 20 people or fewer. So thinking about those as really intimate experiences, they are ones that we're really hoping participants will verbally engage with the audience where there can be some back and forth, some Q&A, either about technique or materials, opposed to the Instagram model where really a person is in more of a monologue mode. They're, mm -hmm. they're demonstrating and they're illustrating for the audience without that kind of give and take. 
Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, and I would take that from the standpoint from a, a museum who is, unlike myself, who is basically putting on musical acts. Mm -hmm. We have some storytelling going on and uh, acting that would be the single person doing their play, which is my. So it's it's interesting from our space, we're, we're trying to just get people to settle down and you've got such a vast um, platform and, and also spectrum of uh, entertainment or just visualizations that people could get involved in. Ty was looking at um, the musical aspects too on the performance side. Um, and I think that's a challenge for anybody in that era because again, like I said, for us, if, you, if you're sitting right where Tyra is right now and she's just got her camera and she's performing to keep that energy up, you've got a different style of energy I think that you have to keep up, Jessica, with the, the person who's doing the presentation and what you're trying to show and telling a story across there. Brett, with um, not only his students, but the, the, the mic portion, you have a mic portion, um, I think there's some some similarity there in respect to the energy that if it wasn't the one on one, the facial time that you've got to make it up somehow in your head that you've got some uh, along with the process that you're using for uh, sending out your 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 presentation. So I think there's some challenges there. And then um, Heather, Heather is working with a group of, of individuals who are all over. I mean farther vast than, than I am and probably the rest of us are. And she has uh, deeper, I think, challenges than some of us do. And Heather, why don't you tell us about what you've been up against and what you've been working with and how you've been getting through this pandemic with your platforms. So we've been trying to bring artists to military families. Um, we've done that live for quite a while now um, with the NC Arts Council. But trying to do this in a digital platform has proved certainly challenging. Um, we run into some of the problems of bringing them to currently serving military. If they're on a military computer, they don't have access to Zoom or Google Meets or almost anything. The only thing that they can see things in is Teams or if we stream it live to another platform like YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram, they can usually get that. So we have that issue of getting them to interact by making sure that we're on a platform where they can actually even access it. Um, and then as far as like reaching kids and stuff, we're trying to make sure that we're using platforms that they're familiar with. So most of them don't use Zoom day to day, but they do use Google Meet. That seems to be kind of what North Carolina has mostly gone with um, across the state of using for their schooling system is the Google suites platforms. Um, mm -hmm. So there's definitely been a lot of learning curve for me in making sure to help bring artists who were already using one platform um, and used to using that platform and then bringing them in to use a different platform and how we integrate that at the same time as creating the content and the, the interaction that they're looking for. I'm sure that's a day-to-day -day, um ebb and flow of what you're going to be picking and choosing on, on whatever various platform you need to use. Um, Sharon, you're, you're going to have to help me here on this because it, uh, we have Earl and Nora about polling our, our attendees with the similar question that was just presented to our panelists. Is that something that we want to do now or is that something we're doing later? How does that work? I think we're going to do that now so that we have a chance to pause. Um, and let the attendees who are with us on Facebook and here in WebEx to kind of join in and give us their perspective or what they're dealing with. Um, and it gives the panelists just a moment to have a drink of water and, and catch their breath. So we want to present this same question to you who are listening and joining us and just um, go ahead and type in the chat uh, for us or if you're on Facebook and let us know your response to this, the question that will come up. And I'm going to say the question as well as you'll see it on your screen, I hope. We are squarely focused since the onset of the pandemic on how we continue to function as artists and supporters of artists through a digital lens and on digital platforms. What has been your go-to digital platform? So you would go ahead and type that into the chat or uh, and let us know how you feel and think about that. And then we can 
while they are doing that, we'll co Sharon and I'll collect their answers. Uh, and Scotty, if you want to go ahead to the next question. Sure, I, I'd love to. I think I want to add just, I never really talked about what the Clayton Center has been really doing in that line. And um, our, our platform base, just from a hardware perspective, and this is something that Brett was sharing with us yesterday. So hopefully we can get some of that conversation about the software to hardware and what your challenges were to pull the two together. But yeah, we came through using Sling Studio, which is basically a device that is an open broadcast system that allows us to work on YouTube, Facebook, and, and Venmo. Um, but if any of you happen to catch uh, a Facebook posting by me on a rant that was a little upset with Facebook when they were saying that they were going to cut back artists' ability to present live and earn a living, uh, I made the decision to move from Facebook to YouTube, which you then um, caused me a little bit of a panic attire because I didn't know that there was any potential cutoff amount of participants. So I have to read my uh, my YouTube up a little bit more. <laughs> it's for private streams, oh, just okay. private streams. Okay. So if it's so, not so, a private stream, then you you should be fine. So okay, so um, you had me going for a minute. I was thinking, where am I have to go next? Um, but with that particular um, piece of uh, equipment, we have also been able to expand to use Zoom with it by getting some other implements. And then again, that goes with hardware and a little bit of software too. That uh, was out with because he has uh, delved deeper and had more, I think, uh, experience and people expressing or teaching how. Uh, the like the AI he was talking about, which I, I too uh, feel like it's going to be pretty scary. Uh, but to, to that extent, and uh, I think we want to. I'll start back right with with Heather. Uh, the second question is: What are some of the ways to overcome barriers to using digital tools for delivery of your work? And, and there, are there any trainings to share or recommend? So essentially, how did you learn about what you're doing? I started the first day with, I wonder how I, um, in my search bar, there was a lot of that uh, the first few weeks. Um, now I've focused more on finding some different professionals. There are several institutes that offer both train, both free and paid trainings. Um, what I like doing is instead of looking for specifics about how to do something through them, I'm looking for more of what creates engagement. So there are a lot of tools out there, like using the breakout rooms in Zoom um, to create a better experience for our participants and sending them into small groups to talk for a few minutes and then bringing them back. And we find that really effective with both children and adults. Um, as far as overcoming the technology, it has literally felt like just a daily battle. Like we just spend every day like, that's okay, we can do this. And every time a problem pops up and I'm like, well, that wasn't the screen I meant for it to share or that didn't go as planned. We just kind of keep rolling. And what we found is that for most of our audience, they enjoy that. Like they're they're fine with that. Nobody's since we're not putting on a huge performance, we're creating an experience for our participants mostly. Um, it kind of feeds into that. and It usually opens up a little bit more conversation for them. So, can you um, explain a little bit on the experience that you're creating? What are you What are you showing? What What are you involved in for where you can tell? That's okay. Um, so, n a number of the things we've done are creating music experiences for kids. So, we did one with some cajon drums where we mailed each kid a cajon drum and then we did three days worth of lessons with them. So, we showed them videos about the background of it. We brought them in to discuss like how you create music from what you have. We encourage them all then to go and build a musical instrument that they felt was part of their house um, and show us that. So it kind of created a way for them to talk with their family, but at the same time, actually learn some rhythms on the drums, understand where the cajon drum had come from and what inspired it, as well as building kind of a greater structure for them to be able to reach out to each other. Um, and then we share with all of them who are interested each other's information so that they can get back in contact with each other. We had a couple who actually decided to get back together. They lived in the same neighborhood and didn't even know each other. Um, so that worked out really well. Like they didn't know each other beforehand, but they were like, oh my gosh, I live in that neighborhood too. And so it provided them a way to, to connect, which is Kind of what our goal is, is with all of this is to create a military, a connection across all of our military. 
I see Brett smiling over there. I think maybe maybe we were thinking about the same thing as you're, you're living in the same neighborhood, but because of technology prior, we didn't really get out of our into our neighborhood and saw our people. And now all of a sudden, because of technology, it's brought us together with people that we would have should have bumped into by being outside doing something. That's that's great. That's a that's a great story, and I see how you're detailing uh, what you have to do for your your clientele, you, your membership, the the spouses and the families. So that's great that you're taking that on. I'm sure that's that's not an easy easy task. And as you said, if technology sort of drops on you somewhere, you got to make it up somewhere else. Yes, thank you. You're welcome, Tyra. But I want to just you? jump in. I'm sorry oh, sure. to interrupt you, Scotty. Um, so if you jump, if uh, if you're one of the attendees and you want to uh, send something to us in the chat, please send to all attendees, um, not just me, so that the panelists can see it. Okay? That would be really great. Thank you. There you go. Scott. Yes, sir. I, I like to just kind of throw this little point out. Um, sure. Heather, Heather made a really good point about how we're approaching this technology drift anyway, or some people call it a technology tsunami, um, is forgiving ourselves, is like the psychological part of it. How do we, and she addressed it, forgive yourselves that you don't know all of this. You don't know what you don't know. So the other part is you're not gonna know it overnight. You have to practice it and you're going to make mistakes. And the one thing that I've noticed with my students in, in class is that they've learned a little bit more forgiveness of each other than of themselves. And I think that that's one of the other things that kind of is missing because the stress levels of people dealing with all this technology has gone through the roof because they're not used to it. So sometimes like we have to, have to take that collective deep breath and understand that we don't know what we don't know, and it's okay to fumble through it sometimes and teach ourselves how to do it and work together with each other. And that's how that's that that's one of the ways it's going to really make make a difference in how we go forward. Because so this is not going to change uh, really soon. You're right, and thank you for bringing that up again. Because yesterday when we had our brief little meeting, you said the same thing: we don't know what we don't know. And I like the fact that you're you're offering the forgiveness for us to. Go back to when we were in school and the reason you were in school was because you weren't supposed to be perfect you were supposed to be trying to learn something and if you made a mistake hopefully you learned from that mistake and you went on forward and better for it so you didn't unmute yourself brett Sorry. as as artists that's what well, that's what artistry is is learning you know we we try something and then we try something else and then we try something else and then we if that felt good, we may try keep trying it again until we get to where we want to go, and then we go do something else. So I think that's you know I think that's one of the things as artists we're used to learning, we're used to changing, we're used to adapting, we're used to anti fragility, we're used to resilience, we're used to all of that. I wish I were, you would have been one of my teachers growing up. But... <laughs> I think Jessica had a point that you wanted to jump in real quick there before we go to Tyra. I did absolutely like you, Scotty. I just love hearing Brett verbalize that, and you know, I think it's such a important attitude for folks to have right now. And you know, as artists, learning these new formats and using them to connect with audiences, I think it's such a healthy mix to really want to um, get a handle on the technology and feel really comfortable with it but also to demonstrate that learning and experimentation for the audience. You know, we're all in the midst of this right now, and we're asking people to do something that they might be uncomfortable with, to learn a new skill, to practice something they haven't yet mastered. And so I think for the artists to embrace that for themselves and share that openly with the audience when they're working across technology, can help break down some of the barriers others might have. Perfect. Thank you. Tyra, what is your take on these uh, these times, the digital world, the barriers, how you've taught yourself to, to utilize these tools now and, and some of the comments you heard from Heather? Well, on the personal side with 
um, just making my music. I know that um, I have a lot to learn about distribution. Um, of course, there's all of the different algorithms that you have to beat now. That wasn't a thing when I was younger. So um, I have to learn a lot about what it takes to be seen, especially since not a lot of people are out right now. Everybody's competing on the same platforms. And so that is uh, that's a really big challenge for me on the personal side. Um, teaching wise, again, just the whole latency with the Zoom calls and the Facebook uh, Skype calls and with STEM. I know that um, the only time that we would perform the shows was in schools. We would travel to elementary schools and put on the same show. Um, and so what we've been thinking about doing now is just making digital versions of the same show. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, every show is 50 minutes long just because there's more singing than there is talking. So we pretty much know how long it's going to be every time. But um, we have two different versions of this show. So um, let's say our audience is kindergarten through third grade, like every single song we sing has different lyrics. So uh, for example, we have a song about math. We have a song about science, technology, engineering, mathematics, all of that. But in the math song in particular, we start out with, you know, how three is greater than two and you need math and baking and you need math in sports. But, you know, when it comes to maybe a third, a later half of third to fifth grade, of course, they're going to be like, why are you guys talking to us about greater than less than? We know these things. So then we start talking about how math is involved in music and the, uh, the Fibonacci sequence, things like that. So it's it would be really easy for us to just record the songs, especially since everything that we all the material we pull from is what they're already learning in school. I think it's called Common Core. Mm -hmm. So with that, we've already begun to make packets to send out to students. Um, we have, we're working on a homeschool program. Um, there are a lot of families that want access to the show and just couldn't because, you know, their children were homeschooled. So we're thinking about um, finding a way to record those two different shows and just distribute them depending on the age of the students. Uh -huh. And that way, not only would it save us traveling time if we could travel, but, um, you know, the, the children are still learning. The children are still getting the message that um, no matter who you are, where you come from, you know, there's there's something for you in the STEM world and the STEM, any field in STEM. So I feel that just finding a way to have it accessible online, I guess would just be recording it mm -hmm. and just syncing everything. Uh, so I want to go back to earlier statements you were talking about um, the algorithms and, and, and learning the processes. Um, how have you uh, attacked it from a learning process? Um, you know, what's have you reached out to other people, you know, um, read something, you know, what, what is, uh, what's teaching you as far as this technology? Because like Brett said, we're all just, we don't know what we don't know. We're just trying to figure it out as we're going along and hopefully we bump into somebody that can share something more for us like we're trying to do right now. Well, I am pretty new at it, but I do have a few friends that just love this kind of stuff. So they've been telling me that uh, one place that you could definitely start, especially if you're new or if you're a beginner, is just look at the most popular hashtags mm -hmm. at the time, especially for especially hashtags that are centered around what you have to do. Um, there was a very specific for a very specific example. Um, nobody really knows, but you know, I ice skate and I haven't gone ice skating in five years and i used to compete and all that other stuff but the, for the first time i went ice skating i put it on instagram and my friend was like you should add hashtag jam skate you should add hashtag all this other stuff so i had like it, it came to so many hashtags that i had to include <laughs> it as a comment and just not in my caption right. and the more hashtags that i included of course on instagram you can follow hashtags um 
for example, for me personally, I I use um, I follow black hashtag black because that's my favorite color. So a lot of things that I wouldn't be following normally, they still come to me if they have that hashtag in them. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, look at that black purse, look at that black couch, stuff like that from people that I don't even know because they use the hashtag. So people who follow whatever hashtag you're using, it will find a way to them. And therefore you can reach a bigger audience. It just all depends on the hashtags that you use. And there's so many of them out there. There's really no limit to what you can put yourself in at this point. That's that's true. I didn't think about that. And, and when you talk about the black handbags and, and the black couch and all of those things coming up forward to you. The, but you did bring up something else that I'd like the others to comment on is the briefly the tools. And I don't mean and, and well, I'm looking at Brett for a second there, the hardware. But like from what Tyra just expressed to help you understand more about what you can do or have that drive because of whatever education or whatever syncopation they have. Have you found individuals that have come into your life now that you may have not had that experience with in the past or wouldn't have if it hadn't been for this particular situation or in that has helped you? with your hardware or software uh, tie-ins to be able to, to get you to the to the presence that you want to be within the organization that you're working for? Well, there's a kind of a complex question, but I, I'll try to answer it simply. Uh, one, I came up at a time where we had sometimes to make do with what we what we had, but also you create the new out of what um, what's already around. Um, as my favorite little cultural philosopher Chuck Brown would say, you have to use what you got to you get what you need. And um, and when I was at Duke, and I, I, I was fortunate that I met some really cool people, and I grew up listening to jazz and wanting to know jazz musicians and spending time. With, I had class with Mary Lou Williams, and this is important because the culture that you're around helps you understand how to use what you have and how to learn. And whether it was Mary Lou Williams or Herbie Hancock, those folks always created something else. People forget Herbie Hancock has actually, actually went to school to become an electrical engineer. Uh, and so when you're around those kind of people who think that kind of logic, uh, I worked for Donald Byrd. Donald Byrd actually had a PhD in education, a law degree, was a private pilot. And by the way, he just happened to be a world famous jazz musician. So. I've been around those kind of people and what they all told me was never be afraid to just go learn and try. And 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 that kind of attitude is what really what, what I think it's like it's more about our approach to life. Um the technology to me is a tool, it's a toolbox. I have technology all over my house, you know, like the hardware software stuff, but I I just actually just rebuilt a computer, well, I didn't rebuild, I just changed the hard drive so I could use it for another um, um, another application so I don't have to go buy something else. You know, it's like one that was already there. Let me use that. Uh, let me, oh, there's this old mic. Or there's this old drum that I, that, oh, let me fix that up and I can use that or I can give it to somebody else that can use it. I think we're in a time now where we are realizing we don't need all the stuff that we have. <laughs> you know, how many, how many? I mean, and I'm 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 a, I'm a hoarder. Um, I'm a collector, excuse me, a collector. <laughs> so you know, it's like I sold off a couple of horns and stuff like that. But my point is, we have all this technology. I, I hang out with a lot of other people who are creatives. Um, I go to things like I went to the uh, Consumer Electronics Show as an educator uh, back in January. My mind was blown because it was everything from flying cars, literally, uh, to um, a, a little uh, printer for ladies' nails because I have a daughter, and I was like, "Hey, you need to check this out." Um, so, I mean, but it was like all everything in between. You know, there's big stuff, there's little stuff. BMW had a whole thing about their electronic cars, and I saw a lot of music stuff and art stuff, and and all kinds of tools that will help us in the future that can help us now. Some of the stuff, the ring lights that everybody is running out to buy, they had a ton of them at CES. Um, the, the LED that I have in front of me, uh, is, I mean, there's so much stuff, but we don't really need all of it. I mean, if I if I wasn't in the middle of class, I probably would have gone outside so I could use natural light just so I could have some sunshine for a little bit. 
<laughs> but, but my whole point is we have we have all these things at our disposal. Um, Heather just made that point of it's each day. What is it I want to do today? And then maybe what I want to do tomorrow, but I need to prepare for it today. And then what Tyra's talking about, how do you learn from other people, listening to each other and not being afraid to uh, like allow somebody to say to you, hey, have you thought about doing it this way? And listening, active listening is one of our greatest skills that we can have and develop right now because we don't know everything. I've been exposed to a lot this year. Uh, Lenora and I were in a, in a certification program, but we were, you know, we're still trying to learn more stuff because um, there's so much out there. And I want to talk to you, by the way, Scott, about that studio, the Sling Studio, because I've been trying to sell between that and the Black Magic ATM. But, you know, I'll, I'll, a little I'll bit. shut up for a little bit. <laughs> no, so, I think. Um, sorry, Scott. Go ahead, go ahead. When you get a chance, I want to uh, offer our attendees to uh, an opportunity to jump in on, on those last two questions that the panelists have been munching on. Uh, that, that just say real quickly, Brett, that wasn't such a complex question. And your answer was very succinct because you drove everybody's responses from Jessica, Heather, and Tyra into a cohesive statement while also bringing us back to reality about not needing all the stuff that we need and working with what we got. And I was going to trying to just kind of lean into what you, you presented, which was our resources. So you're a resource to me. You wanted to, you wanted to ask me a question later about Sling Studio and stuff. Um, Heather's a resource to us because she has gone through challenges of certain equipment that doesn't align with other equipment, but somehow she's made it happen. You know, Jessica is a resource because she is working in a format where she is trying to get people to just appreciate life, art, in, in, a, in, a, in a simple and pleasant and peaceful way. So I, I, I thank you for your comment because it, it wasn't that complex and it was very succinct. And I loved everyone's comments because they, they really pull together what I think people need. We're doing okay. That we're, we're, we're making it. Um, it seems like it's a rough time and it is, but we're making it and all of us are having a tough time. So that means if all of us are having a tough time that we all can get together and, and make it a less tough time together. So anyhow, that's my preach. Anyhow, Lenora, you want to ask a second question to the, uh, <laughs> to our attendees. Yeah, let's see what, let's see what the brain trust is out there and, and the group of folks that are with us, um, online on WebEx and, and um, I was going to say FedEx, <laughs> WebEx and Facebook. Um, okay, so attendees, just put this in the chat, make sure it's to everyone, not just to me, so that everyone can see what you're saying and the panelists can also see it to respond to. So we're going to pose the questions to you. What are some of the ways to overcome barriers to using digital tools for delivery of your work? Any trainings to share or recommend? So I'm going to open this poll so you can see what I said. And I'll leave it long enough for you to, to put in answers. Uh, and while they're doing that, I, I, I just want to jump in and say some of the things that I've been using are Facebook groups. Facebook groups have been really uh, a way to galvanize people behind hashtags, Tyra. So I was working earlier this summer, earlier in the summer, helping creatives who wanted to learn how to get on online, to pivot, and to, to know exactly how to think about their work differently and how to deliver it. And just went through a, a five-day boot camp uh, for people who self-selected to come into that Facebook group. And then from there, those who wanted to, to do more with me worked in a one-on-one, in, -on -one, in a group situation in a class. So Facebook groups has been a great way to get people together. I've had students who have a Facebook group on those people who like to knit and use yarn and, and do crafts. And he has like 800 people in his Facebook group now. So I've seen Facebook groups about everything, plants, uh, ice skating, just about any, any, craft, any idea or how to use uh, dual platforms and used Facebook in a different way. I've also used Dropbox folder and Google Drive to deliver some of my work to clients. Um, if the files, because we're dealing with a lot of video, files are too large to email. And if that's a new idea to you and you freak out like, oh, they say, oh, email me the video and you go, oh, but it won't work. 
if, if, if you're not someone who's savvy with video or the size of video files or where do you put them, how do you get them off of your computer so you're, you don't get that wheel of death, the pinwheel of death that shows that you're out of storage space. So I've been using um, Google Drive folders and Dropbox folders to put my videos of my one-on-one -on -one voice lessons with my students in a place where they, they can go and retrieve them. And, and with WebEx, I have some of the teaching that I'm doing at, at NCCU with the class. I have 25 students in that class, and they want to be able to see the class lecture notes. And so I send them the links, but, but then they don't know how to access, like, what do I do? I, it needs a password? This is confusing. And so we all are going through a, a, a lot of, um, we, we have to be flexible and we have to be patient. So let's see, we've had um, people, let's see, let's see if they put them in the chat because they didn't answer in the poll there. Let me go to the chat and there's some people, there's some things there. Can everybody see them? Good. Okay, we'll get to those a little bit later, but I'm gonna turn it back to Scott and Sharon and I will uh, or go through the, um, Scotty, I have a quick question, and maybe this is a silly question, but we were talking a lot about trial and error and how everyone here has gone through that. And I think we learn a lot by what doesn't work sometimes. And I'm just curious if anybody's willing to share something they tried that just didn't work. Or maybe no one wants to go there. <laughs> I'll share a little bit. Uh, we've had we've struggled with too broad of an audience. So we've found that the saying aim small, miss small is kind of what we shoot for. So we target a smaller, very specific audience, and that has dramatically improved um, our ability to fill the seats that we want and reach the participants in a meaningful way. Um. One of one of my small successes um, that's helped me continue from week to week is this little app called Cash App. Um, because, you, all right, Tyra, I got an amen. Um, and, and it's because I'm still doing a live event with an audience and my audience, I have audience there, but our audience is one third, no, one fourth the size that it once was. So if you, you don't have to be an economist or an accountant to figure out I'm having some challenges. Um, and one of the things we did is, hey, you know, put it up on the, the, the Facebook Live, um, type it into the phone, and surprise, surprise, some people that were watching on Facebook Live donated a cash app. But even a bigger surprise is some of the people who don't carry cash donated that were actually there live in the room. So that's helped out a little bit. Um, so that's been a success. And just to Lenore, something Lenore said, I just want to address real quick. She was talking about sharing video files. Um, so far, Google hasn't started charging us for Gmail yet. And with each Gmail, you get a separate Google Drive. I'll just leave it right there because I don't want to come in after me. <laughs> too late. Too late. They've already going to lock in on you, Brett. Um, to... to uh, to answer briefly on sharing, uh, it wasn't something that we gave up on, but we almost gave up on, and that was trying to integrate Zoom with the Sling Studio. The challenge was, like uh, in many types, the latency where you know my mouth was moving, but the words were either delayed behind the movement of the mouth, which is, can be is, you know detrimental. Uh, what you want to do is be able to possibly be ahead with the vocals so that you can bring it backwards. And that's what we end up doing, but it took a good week and then two days. And those two days were centered around a young man who came into my life who had studied um, recording, digital recording. And he brought in implements to start testing out that I would have just beaten my head against the wall trying to figure out if they even existed. So, you know, here's this older guy, me, with this younger gentleman who... Uh, Brett hopefully would recognize to say, I don't know, he does. Let him step in, he did it, and we were able to then sync that uh, visual with the audio, which then saved us the ability to go ahead and stream the performances out to the North Carolina Stage Company in Asheville. So we al I almost gave in, but I worked with what I had, Brett. <laughs> so... Um, 
Jessica. Had a, I, Scotty, I wanted to share that I had a disaster in answering Sharon's question with StreamYard trying to get Zoom to go to Facebook. So I used StreamYard, but then StreamYard had, um, you had to require everyone to uh, uh, give permission for StreamYard to access. And so people were really jittery about, oh no, I don't wanna give them access. So I was trying to be in a Facebook group live um, but and trying to do it through Zoom, but it wouldn't work. And eventually Zoom kind of got their thing together and StreamYard did too. And Facebook started to participate and be more friendly. So, you know, there was a, a moment of two or three months when they weren't really happy with each other and they weren't trying to really collaborate so that the user experience could be smooth. And that was one thing. And the other thing is a, a, a presenter asked me to do live, um, live uh, liner notes to my album. Um, and so I, I did videos introducing, you know, the background about each song, then put photos all along the way for the song and then put those videos on YouTube. Present as a concert, the people couldn't find it. You know, the, the way that the presenter put together the concert to stream live, it was just so problematic. And then I had tons of people like emailing me. They put my personal email <laughs> in it and I had all these people emailing me like, I can't find it. Where is it? And this was like at nine or 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday. And my, my phone was going ping, ping, ping. And it was just, it was a nightmare. Right. Well, I can understand that being, yeah. There, yeah, the challenges of uh, using any kind of different formatting uh, and uh, hoping that one integrates with the other one uh, doesn't necessarily always equate uh, or trying to skip through for another step. Maybe that's the, the way to look at it. Um, earlier on, you were talking about the tools like you were talking about uh, and Brett brought up about uh, Google Mail and the Gmail and, uh, and, and stuff and then the things that you use with Dropbox. So we're, we're into the next, the third question, which talks about tools. And uh, this question has this to say, have you identified digital tools for which access is an issue for artists? Or would, if you have, please explain what those issues have been. And I, I think I want to start this off with Jessica. What, uh, what access uh, issues may have you had with uh, other tools? Yeah, you know, I've heard others mention wanting to meet people where they're at on the platforms that they're using and they're comfortable with. And so for us, I think one of the biggest access issues has just been trying to help participants learn some of these new platforms, whether it's creating an Instagram account, whether it's creating a Zoom account. Um, you know, there is an element to which you've got to also assist your audience in that creation. Um, for us, some of that's been about sharing links and videos that we found helpful. Some of it has been more um, hands-on. It's been our team scheduling time for, for folks who need a little more one-on-one -on -one in, in getting set, situated with the platform itself. So, you know, we've had some great success in terms of these being platforms that people are using in their daily lives and are incorporating more and more, but that's not the case for everybody. And, and it shouldn't necessarily be the assumption, even thinking about how you can um, sort of marry technology with um, things that people are using in their own homes that aren't tech. Um, so that people can have a, a multi-layered experience. We've tried to do things where there might be an artist introducing um, a skill set or a technique one week and then giving tips, suggestions, um, paths folks might go down over the next seven to 10 days and then having a follow-up session. So having things that are both tech and not connected digitally has been one way for us to deal with part of that access issue. Nice. As Brett would say, working with what you got. Tyra, how about you? Have you found any uh, digital tools that just don't work for you, that uh, the access just isn't working or doesn't work for your students? Um, one thing that I 
I did start doing, which is very strange that uh, Ms. Hammonds did say, was I did start using Dropbox only because um, the latency just get to be too much of a problem for me. Um, it, it was just really, really strange. Like it was okay at the beginning, but then when we, I started getting more intensive and like needing to see things and all of that, it just got to a point where I was like, this lag is not helping. It's really not. So what I've gotten into the um, habit of doing is just getting them to send me like videos of them. Mm -hmm. I will critique them. I will send a video back with all of my critiques, anything that I have to say, any diagrams that I had to draw out or anything. And so um, what I would do is just remove all the files every time and just keep them so that their, you know, their um, memory doesn't get full of videos that they just don't need anymore. But I keep them for my records just so because one thing that I do like to do or what I liked to do was to show them their first video from the first of the month and then yeah. show them the video from uh, the 30th of the 31st. And so it always helped them, you know, be like, oh yeah, I'm like I've really grown, you know, I've actually, you know, I, I didn't really see it when I was in it, but you know, I, I am getting better. And so I feel that just videos, the time difference is a little concerning just because you don't have to wait for them to make the video and send it. And then they have to wait for me to receive the video, make my notes and make another video back. But it has yeah. helped in terms of what I need to say. Of course, sometimes in the moment you may forget something or other, other things like that. But with an actual video, I've been able to watch it multiple times, write things down so I can have a succinct video to uh, send back to them. So I guess my my fails were the Zoom, Skype, and FaceTime calls. And so I've just resorted to sending videos back and forth because then, you know, not only does the quality is, is usually better than anyway, mm -hmm. but I have more time to digest what happened in the video instead of what's happening in the moment. I'll say that. I kind of just um, have you tried using Vimeo or YouTube as a private account for students, like having them create one and then they can just send you the link. That way you're not having to send videos back and forth. You can just, they can create a private account, you have the access, and then they can just send you a link and then you just click on the link and there it is. No, I tried. Uh, YouTube yet, but I'm definitely going to look into it. Yeah, because... YouTube or Vimeo, and just because um, I, I teach video production, mm -hmm. and all of my students have to create a YouTube account, and they put they put theirs on a Facebook page, and some of them don't do Facebook, so they'll create basically a burner account. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's like some of them are being stalked, you know, whatever. But you know, they <laughs> they just create a different. <laughs> Yeah, no, they create a separate page for just the class, and then they put their things up for YouTube. If it's a YouTube, they can send me a link, um, and once I have the password, or I'm allowed to, I'm one of the people allowed to to view it. I can take a look at it, and then they drop the account later. Okay. It's just a suggestion. To just think about it. Okay. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I don't know why I didn't give that any thought yet. That's thank you. That's why we're on this. You can't uh, think of everything. <laughs> we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> and then there's Brett, and he tells us what we don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And so Heather, you with the multiple platforms and the different of uh, individuals that you're working with, and the families and the settings, um, I'm sure that you have. Um, come up with some tool issues that have worked and some that really have not worked. And can you can you kind of abreast us of what uh, what your negatives and positives have been? So we've definitely found that because we have such a wide audience of ages, so we have everything from kids up to people who are in their 40s or early 50s, usually trying to participate. 
um, the technology gap is certainly great. Like the kids, but we also run into the problem of a lot of the kids don't have social accounts, so we can't rely on that. Like we can't use that as a way to reach them because they don't have social media accounts. So some of the younger kids um, and some of the older folks like me um, don't have the they don't participate in social media either. So there's, or they only do Facebook versus if we're pushing out on Instagram um, or if we're only in Twitter or, you know, it kind of depends on where we are. So one of the things that we found is that what we really try to do is push out live through Facebook and then also go back and then repost that in a lot of other places if we can. Um, even if we can only give them a small snippet of what we were doing as a way to like entice them to come and join us the next time. Um, I also have made it a habit that I'm on 30 minutes early. That I'm on 30 minutes early. I tell them they're welcome to log on 30 minutes early, especially if they're concerned with tech and I can help make sure that they get in there and then they can go on about their time. If it worked out great and if it didn't, I have a lot of time to, for, to work with it. Perfect. Brett, let's, uh, let's let you feed in 1 more time with uh, not only just uh, sharing what uh, Tyra could do with YouTube, but what other um, tools that maybe you've encountered that just. No, go and, and others that maybe are a more positive. Uh, experience for you and your, your students too. Well, we've been using, we've been doing a lot of training things and certifications. So the Google news initiative has been big. Um. Adobe just finished Adobe Max last week, which was amazing. Um, I put a link to this one video of an artist, and I was just sitting there with my mouth open at home watching how she's using the pandemic to redevelop and develop things. And she has a tech company. I mean, she just she's absolutely amazing. Um, but. I think I shared a story with you yesterday about the, the young lady we um, last year I was out in Silicon Valley and she was a former K-12 teacher showing us AR and VR, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, or as they refer to it now as XR, which is extended reality, which is different. Um, and she was just showing us all these different things to do that weren't terribly, like you just have to sit down and do them. And as you do them, you learn them. The more you do them, the better you get. Uh, Unity is another big one that's coming down the pike that is going to be like the backbone of the gaming industry and of manufacturing. It's like across the board. Um, and that's one of the other ones. I'm still trying to get into Unity. It's like my brain, gets, I get a headache when I do Unity. Um, but for the students, it's mostly been the Google tool and making sure they understand them um, because the Google suite is really powerful and there's a lot of training free for that. Uh, they've been working on um, uh, some of the Facebook and uh, Instagram uh, analytics stuff so they can understand how to do what Tyra was talking about, which is understand the numbers behind the, the, the um, behind the platforms. Because there's a saying, um, I, I, I attend million cups RTP, which is like an entrepreneurship thing, because I learned from them too. That's the other thing, uh, diversify your arenas. And one of the things they talk about is if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. And if we're talking about artists and being teachers and whatnot, we're a business. Uh, you're a business over there, Scotty, at Clayton, right? You're trying to keep the doors open. So, you know, that, and that's one of the other things. It's like we, we can't separate the art from the business. So not only do we have to understand the technology, how to use it as our creative, but we also have to use it for to handle our business. So we have to do both. And Good point. yeah, so the other and the other big part is just I keep going back to we have to forgive ourselves and understand stuff. So um and just reach out and partner with people, collaborate. Um, you don't need to buy every software platform or subscribe to every platform. Partner with somebody else that has it and doesn't mind working with you because maybe they're the videographer and they want to build their videography portfolio and you're a singer or you're an artist. Um, partner with people. This We can partner so much better now because we got these little tiles in front of us. 
uh, no matter what platform. Oh, and one other thing, I, I was thinking about this earlier, and I just want to say it right now. Um, you're a user of whatever platform you're using, whatever software, whatever hardware. If you're having some challenges, reach out to the vendor, mm -hmm. reach out to the whoever you bought it from, but also reach out to the company. They all have departments where they're looking for people to give them feedback. They make a right now. Think about we're on WebEx. First of all, the guys, if I'm not mistaken, the guys who built Zoom are the ones who built the original platform that WebEx is before Cisco bought it. And they left to do something the way they thought it should have been done. So all of these people are competing with each other and they're trying to make each one of their platforms better than the other and they're updating on a regular basis. So they're learning as they go along too. So they may be the smart kids in the room, but we're smart and we're creative. So let's inform them of what we need. And if it'll make them money, they'll they'll put it in. I mean, some <laughs> of the features, think about it. Some of the features that we've been talking about that have been our frustration weren't there re, uh, up until recently. This year, we've seen a lot of the tech. Now, who knew, who knew about Microsoft Teams other than people in the tech industry? You know, now Microsoft Teams is becoming one of the hot platforms. Uh, Google Google Meets, uh, some people, it's been around, but now people are using it for meetings. Uh, you know, there, there's all this stuff because everybody is forced into it. So let's just, you know, let's take a deep breath and just kind of like, you know, go along for the ride and don't, mind, don't, don't be afraid to provide feedback to the people who, whose tools we're using. They'll change. Excellent points, and I think uh, I think there's some other questions that'll be coming our way through Sharon. But I just wanted to say to the uh, the four of you, um, I'm very honored to be able to be in your presence and to hear your stories. But I'm honored in the fact that, and I'll stick myself in there just for a second. We didn't just sit back and say that's it. We didn't give up. Um, we found a reason for whatever it was, personal wise, or whether you have people depending on you or a department depending on you or whatever it may be, you stuck in and you're sticking in and you're going forward and you're trying to help others out. And that has to be a um, hundred plus applause for, for you guys just wanting to be able to help one another, help your students, help your families, help the families, everything else. So I applaud you all so much for just being in there and staying in there and, and sticking it out and not giving up. So, you know, hats off to you all for doing what you've done. Scotty, that is so true. This year, uh, you know, I, I think there are rainbows to this last few months, even though sometimes they're hard to see. And that has been one of the things that's come clear is the inspiration and creativity that's come out of this community is phenomenal. And, and we will survive this, we will. We've got a couple of questions that have come in through the chat. Um, that I thought we should uh, at least touch on. One of the um, participants, Penny, has asked, has anyone tried Twitch TV? I think the United Arts Council of Raleigh used it for first, first Fridays back in the summer. Has anybody had that experience? I think Clayton has been using it. I know he's not official, but he's he's one of our support people. <laughs> No, I mean, we have to acknowledge the fact that because uh, Clayton and Tamisha, uh, Clayton's a DJ, Tamisha's a singer, and Clayton, I know for a fact that uses Twitch. Clayton, I say, Clayton, want to meet yourself and talk, boy. Yeah, I know I'm you're not yourself. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I, I've tried many different platforms. Uh, Twitch is probably my favorite. I, I do like Zoom because it's closed, but when I am, when I perform for a greater audience, Twitch has a built in chat and that's important. Uh, some of the other platforms like Facebook and Facebook and Instagram for DJs is terrible because they, um, their algorithms seek out songs that are being played without the artist's permission. And so they cut you off. Instagram has an automatic 60 minute uh, time limit and Facebook will cut you off. Twitch, they kind of get you after you perform, but in a streaming <laughs> situation, it's pretty good. And they also have the ability to collect money right there on the platform. Yeah. And, tw and Twitch is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is actually built primarily, it was originally built for gaming. Yes, correct. Okay. Well, you have been hiding that, Clayton. I've just been asking Clayton to like market the program and he's like a DJ? What? I've got work life and I've got fun life. <laughs> wow. 
All right, Clayton, we're gonna we're gonna use you and abuse you in a new way. Um, <laughs> Okay, we have another question from Elaine Bromke. Um, I will soon be sending a link to a file of my show that is 1.15 gigabytes, very big, from my Vimeo Plus account. Should I anticipate any problems in the leasing audiences opening the file and using it in a screen share on Zoom for their meetings? Send the link, don't send the file. If they need it that badly, they can download it from Vimeo. Good point, Jessica. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely send it as a link and not a file. And if if the recipients are going to be using it in Zoom, was that the second half? Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they will want to download it onto their system before the Zoom starts. So rather than running the risk of their bandwidth not being able to support it during the Zoom, having it on their hard drive will make for a better experience. That's great. I, um, there's another thing from the um, attendees from Angel Dozier. She said, this made me think of a great example from when the shelter in place mandates began. Erica Badu launched her virtual show in late March, early April. It was full of tech issues and wasn't as enjoyable. She took it offline, examined all the issues she experienced in terms of sound, lighting, and relaunched with the most amazing concert setup. Now she has a whole new stream of income and can still operate as a touring artist just online on her own platform. I think that just benefited or, or supported a lot of what Brett has been trying to share with us. You know, you don't know what you don't know and you start to learn from it and you can always adapt it and change it and bring it back. I have another question. This is kind of off in a different direction that I thought of earlier. And Heather, when you were talking about your audiences and all the different types of people and groups that you were attracting to your programming. Um, do you find issues in dealing with military schools? And if you're teaching artists, can you speak to the need to know your audience and how they will be receiving your work? Does that make sense? So we haven't really been in the schools. We've been doing through family programming centers on the posts. Um, kind of allowing us to bypass the schools and instead be in the homes with the parents and letting them make that choice. So that's made it a little bit easier for us. Um, most of the schools operate under the DOD EA Department of Education stuff, um, and they do a lot with artists coming in on a regular basis. So I assume that they're probably looking for things to do there. Their security isn't going to look very much different than most other schools that you would see as far as like what they what they want to do to protect kids in general. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing uh, more and more as I talk to people the last week or two about what they in school systems. And since a, a lot of our audience are artists or teaching artists that want to market their work through schools, that the spring is going to be up in the air. Um, it could be hybrid. It could be 100% virtual. Um, but one thing that they do know for sure that they do not want artists and guests in the schools. So whatever their um, existence looks like, the artists are going to have to find a way to present in a virtual manner. And I wondered if any of you could speak to that. How do you um, find out what works best for the people that you want to market to. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does to me. I read, I read the comments. I mean, my, my people at the open mic, if I had, I mean, they alerted me to an audio problem I had one time, um, but they, they'll, they'll put it right in the comments. They'll tell you, oh, the guitar is too loud or the mix is off or somebody's standing in front of the, the you know, uh, or, you know, have you thought about this platform? Have you thought about in addition? I mean, your audience, if you pay attention to them and you develop a, a rapport with them, they will let you know. Um, they Like they just did with Erica Badu. Um, they'll let you know uh, how they feel about it. And some of them will even give you solutions. They'll offer you the solutions for it. So, um, and, and the often solutions and whatnot, 
I would just like to kind of ask, because uh, infrastructure so and support is a big thing when we start talking about this. If we're um, like you're at the the museum at Nasher, and uh, how much support are you getting to do what you do? Scotty has a sling studio, but he can't run the whole sling studio by himself. Uh, Lenora has Clayton on here, and I saw Tamisha on here earlier. She has people helping her with this. How do you, I mean, that's one of the big things, the big challenges, because we can't do all this all the time by ourselves. So right. I'd like for everybody to talk about the, pardon me, Scott, uh, just yeah. I'd like for everybody to talk about the infrastructure and, and who do you have as your support team? Who's the rest of your team? I'll, I'll, go, real, I'll go real quick. Um, I've been fortunate that the town has viewed us as being essential. Um, from also though we have also taken on other tasks for in the town like answering phones and even cleaning the building and doing certain aspects and taking on other chores that's fine but i still have the four main people that have been here ever since i started here as part of the helping with the marketing of it helping with the social media aspects of it the artwork that we then turn into whoever's uh, distributing the digital marketing for us through a company that i use and then when it comes uh, Wednesday night stream night, um, I have the, the gentleman that still runs the lights. I have a part time guy that does the audio for me. Um, I have two other individuals that will help with camera and then I jump in when there's a camera and or do the switching. So um, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I still have individuals that I'm able to keep right here to help work this through. Yeah, my similar my situation similar to Scotty's in that being at an institution. We just naturally have a, a built in network of folks. So for the programs we're leading on Instagram, there is a full team from our marketing team to our special events team who are helping with all different aspects of the Instagram programs. Um, and then within the pieces we're doing on Zoom, there are 17 educators who are all teaching across Zoom, whether it be K-12 or adults. Um, and so across that 17, we have such a myriad of experiences and knowledge base that when somebody's having a question about PowerPoint, when somebody's curious about sharing files, um, that within the team, we've got all of these folks that can share their expertise and lean on one another. So to your point earlier, Brett, about um, partnering up and finding other folks who they've got a corner of it and you've got a corner of it and how do we all work together and how do we share across what everyone's doing so so that we can all be better at this Sharon I'll also use this opportunity your question around um, how we can predict what it is schools are wanting and needing coming up in the spring for us um, it is about being prepared across multiple platforms being familiar with Zoom, because that's what Durham is using, being familiar with Microsoft that Chapel Hill and Wake County are using. Um, and then in the registration process for schools, asking really specific questions, asking about their platforms, asking about if their classroom is exclusively virtual, if it's a hybrid situation, trying to go into every session with as much information as possible can make the artist experience infinitely smoother. I think one of the things that we've found successful in engaging children, particularly, and while we've done it on a small scale, I could see this working well in a school, is having things that the kids engage with physically there, as well as doing the artist portion, even if that's virtual. So even though the artist isn't there, there's things that the children have that are physical and tactile that they can use to experience the event. Um, without that tactile experience, we find that we really lose them. Um, so for us, that means we're mailing to individual homes, but for a school that gives you a little bit more flexibility, there's drop shipping options and stuff like that, like you're not sending to each individual home and paying that um, potentially dropping off or looking at different ways 
But for us, it's definitely been the tactile experience at the younger levels and honestly, even up through high school. I think it was interesting. Um, I think it was late in the spring and early fall that um, some of the school systems were trying to meet that exact point that kids need to learn in various ways. And hearing the artists and seeing the artists is great, but they need to somehow apply it. And they were actually creating kits that, uh, you know, synchronized with the work being done by the artists and sending them out on the school bus routes or on the food pickup sites. So that again is that communication thing with whoever your intended artist is to see if that can happen. I really love this conversation because it shows that most of us are either have pivoted or are pivoting and are being flexible in ways that we didn't even assume we had to think about. And it really shows that our field um, um, is deep and wide in the whole technology conversation now. It's not, it's not that STEM is only for science and technology and engineering and math teachers. It definitely is for all of us. I would like to address that, Lenora, um, because you're, you're dead on it. And there have been times I've done so many, I, I, I came out of media, so I, I worked in television for a while, a long while. And whenever I go interview these top scientists, a Nobel nominee or some engineer, we wind up talking about music or art. And half the time there, like one guy was a, um, a one woman at IBM, her son was had won all these math competition, but he also won the jazz piano competition. And it was going to industrial light and magic to teach. My point is Donald Byrd's um, master's degree, I mean, his PhD was on the relationship between jazz music and math. And so this, there's all this research out there, and this is something that as artists for us to sell what we do. Um, the, the connection between the neuro, the, the neurology stuff, I don't do that, but it's, it's total connection between the creative and the technical and the STEM. And the people who are the best at the tech are usually people who are very creative on the back end. And it's just that we have to make sure that we, we, we put that out there because sometimes we get so caught up in the art part and it's arts versus STEM, arts versus the technology. It's not. The technology comes about because of the creativity of people who know how to do the, you know, to do the STEM and it feeds off of each other. It goes back and forth. So let's not forget that. I just want to put a, put a word in for the creatives who are also technologists. Mm -hmm. We've also had to change our um, our platform just a little bit with STEM. Um, it, it's still STEM the musical, of course, but one of the problems that we were facing, uh, one of the problems that we still face even now, like a lot of parents will come up to us and like, where's the A? It's STEM now. So I'm just like, oh my God. Like, And, and I uh, presented that question to the directors and they were like, um, well, the A is kind of what what you're doing, you know, like you're singing, you're dancing, you know, it's it's just incorporated in there. So um, I can't ex I can't remember exactly what the new slogan was, but we um, it has something to do with like making sure that art is in STEM. The fact that uh, we were presenting it in the way that we were was the A in STEAM, and I know a lot of people are focusing on STEAM now. And so I I do wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying. And I, I remember like having to think about it that way because going into it, I, I actually forgot. Yeah, on my changed uh, one of the things on my my CV and on my bio. And I said, I'm a STEM researcher because when I'm looking for money and funding for the NCCU Teaching Artist Certificate Program, uh, when I'm talking about the work that the artists can do and the students can do in that program, it's definitely STEM. It's definitely technology. 
music is mad. So I don't, I don't allow them to put me in a place where A has to be, oh, please, can we be included? No. <laughs> yeah, we've never, the, leaving the A out of the, the STEM argument or just leaving the arts and creativity out of the STEM argument has always been detrimental to innovation anyway. So, and that's, that's not an opinion. They have research to prove it. Um, as a matter of fact, over at Duke, they have a whole neuroscience division that'll prove it. Uh, over in the, what used what was called the Ruby, I guess it's still called the Ruby, uh, the new performing arts center. Uh, Demon, which is Duke Entertainment Media Arts Network, when they have their Demon Week um, weekend, there's always people over there talking about the connection between like biomedical engineering and some violinist or some artist and some physicist. I mean, they're doing those kinds of things there right now. This is not theoretical. This is for real. And they're doing the research to prove this. And it's it's not something they didn't know already. They're just putting it together. So I just want us to make sure that we are making sure that we are not undervaluing ourselves. Which is which has always uh, seemed to be uh, in a circular fashion, just like history, in that we, we come back to the point of the liberal arts or the creatives and the comparisons of, like you're saying, with mathematics and and uh, music. Accomplishing ourselves and what we can do and how we help support those who want to for some reason, uh, travel in our, some of our footsteps um, because uh, we need them. We need them to be able to use this thing you talked about, which was between our ears, which is the best uh, piece of uh, equipment that we have and how to also be thinking outside the box like many of you uh, are doing. So, uh, yeah, great talk. This has been amazing. Oh, I'm sorry, Tyra, please. No, I was I was putting on some chaps. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going no. <laughs> this has been such a dynamic conversation. We so appreciate each and every one of you taking part. Um, I think you've given us much to think about, and um, our artists kind of some options. I think they're going to be excited that you don't have to be an expert in any one thing. That trial and error is so important, and will help you to make those connections that you need. And this team building uh, that's going on across the state, I, I couldn't be happier and it is so important. So reach out to those around you, um, connect with people who may have the same questions or have answers for you, but make sure that you reach out and get yourself some support. Um, thank you again, panelists. We're about out of time. We've got a minute or two. Um, Sharon, there's one more question from me. There is. Yeah, she wants to know if we can catch her question before we leave. Uh, she asks, um, uh, she definitely doesn't know what she doesn't know. If, if from my paid Vimeo account, I send a link and password to one item on my Vimeo account, people with the password can only see that one item, right? Not the other videos on my Vimeo Plus account. Anyone Do we have any know? Vimeo experts? Well, I, I believe I believe that if she assigns that one video piece will have its own link, its distinctive link, which will be its password. If she only shares that, that's all they get to see. It's not everything else that's in her private account, unless she just opens up her private account, which that would be a whole process of her giving her old password away. Yeah, I think that's correct, Scotty. And my suggestion, one thing that I've done with questions like this for myself is send it to a buddy. If you're curious, if you wonder what's right. going to be able to see, send it to someone you trust and ask them to dig around and see what folks have access to. That's a great idea. That's yeah. a great idea. And don't be afraid to reach back out to the companies. They, they have people that you get paid to answer questions. I love I'm that. I'm tell you, I created a specific dummy account that I send things to to test that's not create that doesn't touch any of my other accounts. So that's also a way to start with the testing and then send it to a friend who's knowledgeable kind of thing, kind of layers. 
Great idea. Wonderful idea. All right, folks. Well, we are out of time, and I'm, I'm, I have a feeling we could go on with some more questions. Um, please join us for the next Teaching Hours Tuesday, which is going to be on November 10th. And it's going to be a slightly different uh, format. It will be a town hall. Are we ready to rumble? And what we mean by that, okay, we're getting to the end of 2020. Now what? Um, we're going to hear from people that actually uh, fund and hire artists, both locally, uh, statewide, and hopefully nationally. So it should be very informative. So be sure and join us uh, on the 10th, same time. Um, Thank you for Zoom there. Sharon, didn't mean to step on you there. The link is that's in the okay. chat. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you again to our wonderful panelists and all of those that have joined us. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Miss. You mute it, Lenore. <laughs> you all were awesome. <laughs> you were awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was so much fun. Thank you. It's been amazing. I cannot Thank wait you. to. to